Okay, good morning all. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so today's agenda for lab seven preparation, we're going to talk about creating tables and also uh, dealing with storage management. So you can essentially focus on how to create partition tables uh, for lab seven. So when we talk about uh, creating tables, this is the one thing that we are going to focus on the most today. Um, creating database objects with uh, um, using the create statement in the database. So, and this is uh, will be based on lab uh, lab seven is based on lab six in the sense that lab six has the database schema that you all have created and submitted and um, lab seven will have um, lab seven will have the uh, tables created uh, using SQL uh, using these uh, data definition language we're about to cover as part of the discussion today also in addition to create learning how to do uh, work with creating tables and objects in the database we're going to also look at how the database is in fact stored in the database uh, how is the data stored and that will uh, form the basis for our um, understanding of uh, setting up database partitioning uh, an exercise I'm requesting you to go through in second part of the lab assignment. So, so the first things first, um, talking about uh, creating objects in the database. So one of the things to consider is to go to oracle.com and download the uh, SQL reference and also the server concepts manual if you can. Because the the benefit of uh, benefit of doing that is that you'll be able to uh, refer to some of the technicalities that uh, come up during the during the subject matter in the online reference manuals, which, in my opinion, is very handy for for the most part. So our goal is to create learn how to create database objects. Uh, we are focusing on uh, table and the constraints using the create and alter statements. One of the things we'll, we will talk about is what a constraint is and uh, what a table is um, and how the two are related to each other when you are working with the when you're working with the database. We're also going to learn some of the advanced create table concepts mainly how the partition objects are created and how we create uh, the the storage management how do we take care of storage management which is the physical properties of the table inside a table space so we'll we'll focus on both of both of those um, there are five types of database objects table which is the uh, which is basically where the information is stored in rows and columns. Um, you're familiar with this idea because we have dealt with selecting data from multiple tables earlier. We've also talked about views, which is basically uh, a logical structure, which also looks like rows and columns, but generally created using uh, a select statement. So it's an outcome. It's like trying to save a query permanently in a view. Then we have a sequence, which basically is an object that can that can generate unique values and is generally associated with the primary key. So we can uh, generate unique values for the for the primary key. I'm assuming you all remember what uh, what a primary key is. Uh, it's basically a unique value in the table that the rest of the columns depend on. Then we have indexes, which basically improve the performance of the queries. And this database object is also like a table, 
but uh, it, it operates just like the index in the back of the book. You take a several set of key concepts and you associate page numbers to it. And then when you have to look up some, some information, you can look in the index and then go to a specific page number in the book. Same way in the database, uh, we, same way in the database we end up um, with an index where we, if you want to do a lookup on, uh, you know, the employee ID or employee name, then it will have a row ID associated with it. So we'll know exactly where to fetch the object from. So that's how an index will improve the performance. And then we have synonyms, which is like giving an alias. So like my real name is Sukhjit, but I also use the word Bob. Uh, that's basically like a synonym. It, it gives an alternative name uh, to, to an object. Uh, and in a database, the synonym usage is pretty common um, to essentially make the accessibility of the objects easier. So, um, there are some naming conventions you all have to follow. I mean, uh, you must... Uh, when you name an object uh, of the five types that we did talk about, you must begin with a letter that can be up to 30 characters long using these uh, characters that you see in front of you. A through the upper and lower case, zero through nine, underscore dollar or hash sign. We cannot duplicate name of another object owned by the same user. So that refers to, when we talk about users, we refer to the schema name and we cannot have duplicate names uh, we basically cannot have duplicate object names in the in the same schema and we also should not use any of the reserved words like the word create or alter these cannot be used for um, for creating the the object so the next thing is using the create table statement the create table statement itself um, basically will have um, the the syntax is the high level syntax is shown on this slide um, so when I log into the database I must have a database privilege called create table to create tables and I also should have a place to save them so usually when like your user accounts are created a certain amount of space is allocated or for you for you all to create the uh, for, for you all to create your tables. So we, the required things are, you specify the table names, the column name, the data type, and the size. These are four important things that must be specified. Of course, there are additional that we'll talk about um, as we go along. Now, if let's say uh, a table is created by Mama, then I need to access it. I would uh, basically, one, Mohammed will have to give me permission to access his schema. And so that will be done with the uh, grant and revoke statements. We'll cover those down the road. Uh, but uh, he can go in and say, okay, grant Bob access to the specific table. Now, once he takes care of that statement and he gives me access to his uh, database, uh, you know, one table in the database schema, I can go and refer to that schema using uh, his name dot uh, object name. So, it, you know, if his login ID is uh, Muhammad dot, uh, you know, I can use a uh, table name like EMP or something. So, um, that's what this slide is trying to tell you, that tables that belong to other users are not in the same user schema. Each person uh, provides access by using the grant or revoke command and you should use the owner's name as the prefix so uh, so that's how uh, the referencing of the table works here is a simple create table statement that shows you uh, how the department table is created so we say create table department we have department number department name and location you can clearly see that we uh, specify the table name, uh, we specify the column names, and we also specify the data types. The data types that you can use 
Uh, there's about eight of them total, and I'll cover the list in a moment. But uh, when the table is created, you don't have to do commit. This one, you know, when the moment I hit semicolon and hit enter, the data that is associated with the table is uh, stored in the data dictionary. So uh, is everyone familiar or conversant with the idea of the data dictionary? Um, basically, a storage unit in the database that contains information on tables or other database objects. So uh, where this department table will be created, what columns it will have, what are the data types of the columns, uh, how many rows are in the table, those kinds of things are all saved in the data dictionary. In fact, when I say describe department, that command in fact uses the data dictionary to give me the information that you see here. So we have the name of the table and the data type that's shown. If there are constraints that are added like the null constraint that will also show up uh, when you describe the department. So, so tables that are different types of tables that exist in the database. The user tables, these are like employee and department tables that you all create using the create table command. And then we have the data dictionary. The data dictionary is uh, a collection of tables that are created and maintained by the Oracle server. And it contains database information. So uh, like the kinds of things, you know, information on tables, information on indexes, etc. So um, here is an example of our, our data dictionary table. Here you can see that when we describe the table, we have user tables, user objects, and user catalogs. So we can say select star from user tables. That gives us all the tables that are owned by a given user. You might get more than few tables that you may not have created because some of the system tables show up as user tables as well. We can also view the different types of objects. So if I want to know indexes or constraints added, the user objects view will provide that information. Then we have user catalog. If I want to look at tables, views, synonyms, and sequences that are, that are owned by the user. If I end up creating a stored procedure, uh, which is basically like a, uh, like a program in SQL, that will be viewable, uh, at least in the uh, the name and other primary information will be uh, viewable in the user objects dictionary. So, concept of data dictionary clear, everyone? At least just a, a starting point. Everyone okay? Can hear me well? People in the room, can you all hear me okay? Okay, I guess I'll keep going. So, these are the different data types that we have. So, we have Watcher 2, which is a widely used um, data type that will save up to 32,000 characters. Char data type is, is fixed length, generally up to 255 characters in size. Um, so fixed length and variable length. So if I take the word Bob and I put it in the char data type and I create a char column of size 10, then it's going to use 10 characters, even though Bob is only 3. If I put that same name in Watcher 2, then it will only use three characters, even though the size may be, may be set to 10. So that's what we mean by fixed and variable length. To an extent, you dealt with this when we were, uh, to an extent, you guys dealt with this when, um, uh, when we focused on uh, working with the e-name or employee name 
like we were trying to find, if you remember, names that end with N or start with L and so on. Um, so you you may recall those uh, exercises and uh, we were dealing with a fixed length uh, watcher two. And the point was that we can use the trim command to access the value. So we can use the trim command to uh, get rid of leading and trailing spaces. Sorry, forgive me for that uh, pause there. Then we have the number data type where we specify the precision and the size. So this is for all numeric data. Uh, we have the date data type where the date and time values can be specified all the way from the year to seconds. We have a long, which has to do with the character data type and it can be up to two gigs in size. Now we're starting to get, uh, we're, now we're starting to get into large data, um, large data values. We also have clogs, uh, which is a reincarnation of uh, long, um, which can be up to four gigs in size, and it's a single byte character data setup. Long and uh, long raw and raw are used for binary data. Blob is also for binary data, but can be up to four gigs in size. And then we have B file, which is binary data stored in a single file up to four gigs in size. This is generally uh, like, you know, if you want to save a movie in the file system and then save a reference of that in the in the database for, for quick access. We're not gonna use um, these last five in this course, but we will end up using the first four. Varchar two char, number and date data type. So, so. Create table statement can also be used with a subquery. So we can, this is also called as create table as select or CTAS uh, statement. So we can create a table and insert rows in it all at the same time by using a subquery. So we say create table, table name, and we can specify the column names, uh, Anything that you uh, anything that you see in rectangular brackets is um, optional, not required. So we can specify a bunch of column names, specify a subquery, and we're done. And then what what the statement does is it creates the columns. Um, it comes. It also inherits the default values, and it will also bring out the the, va the values that are selected and then saved into the uh, saved into the newer table. Something like this. We have create table department as and then we have a bunch of columns from EMP where department number equals 30. So if we describe the department table, you know, it will have these values. It will be worth your time to to try this out and see um, what values uh, show up. Uh, even you, I mean, when you describe the table and also do a select on the department table. Let's create it like this. So. Create table as select is a common endeavor for uh, making a copy of the database from, um, from one table to, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a good endeavor for making a copy of a table. So from one table to another, if you want to just do a backup or make a copy of the table, it's it's a very good option uh, to use. We do have an alter table command, which is um, very extensive, just like create table. Um, so if there are things that you want to, if there are things that you want to modify, then we can use the alter table statement. So we can use it to add a new column, modify an existing column um, as shown here. So we've got alter table, table name, and we can add a column or we can modify a column to kind of give you a give you an idea. So here is how we use that. So if you want to add a column, we can say alter table department, add, and then specify the new column name. Keep in mind when the 
new column is added, it becomes the last column and uh, there are no values. Like if the table already has say 10, 15 or 20 values, we're not going to get any default values for uh, the new column that's added. So we'll have to run an update statement and add a new value for each column uh, to make sure the necessary data is uh, there for the job uh, column as we just added, as we just added. So modifying a column, you can change the data type, size, and default values of a column. So that's what you see here is that when I say modify ename, uh, I'm changing the column size from say 10 to 15. So, and that does not affect the existing values, but it impacts the future or any updates that you may end up doing to the, any updates you may end up doing to the, uh, to the ENA. Um, it's, it's a good idea to write comments in, I mean, as a, as a general coding practice, yeah, uh, this is a preferred mechanism where we can add comments to a table by using the comment statement, like you see here. So we have to specify uh, what object the comment is on. And then the comment itself is usually added in single quotes. So all these comments can be seen in the uh, in the data dictionary. So we have uh, all column comments and all tab comments. So those data dictionary values can be used for, for this. So. Constraints. This is part of the create table statement that is uh, very important uh, and it's used for enforcing the rules at the, at the table level. It prevents the deletion of a table. Uh, of, it prevents the deletion of data in a table or even the table itself if there are dependencies. So there are five types of constraints that are covered. Not null, unique, primary key, foreign key, and check constraint. Each one of these can either be applied at the column level or table level or both. And as we go through each one of these constraints, You'll be able to see what uh, you'll be able to see how that works. So, constraints. Um, there's a default value, default name that is generated for the constraints, which generally starts with the word sys underscore c, and then the number. And so it's just a numerical ascending order of the value n, which uh, if if a system generated name is used for a constraint makes it very hard to trace and track. So, uh, because then you have to go and look at, you know, more information about the constraint and see what it's associated with. A better way of dealing with constraints is to uh, give your own name, which helps you understand or justify, which helps you understand in time of need what the constraint uh, is for, what object it's for, and, and, the, and the purpose it serves. Um, constraints can be added when the table is created, so using create table statement, or constraint can also be added using the alter table statement. And like I said earlier, the constraint can be defined at both uh, table or uh, column level. So. And then once the constraint is added, there are data dictionaries that allow us to view the the constraint information. Here's how defining a constraint works. This one shows that we use the keyword constraint. So we first go in and add all the columns we need for the table. And then we use the word constraint and then provide a name of the constraint. Um, please take a look at the naming convention. So it says the primary key constraint 
is being added on the EMP table on the column employee number. So, and then we use the keyword primary key and use and then say EMP. Then we then we specify the columns that can be associated with the primary key. I can use more than one column. So if let's say I wanted employee number and employee name in combination. Uh, if I wanted in combination those two values to be unique, then uh, we have a, a unique, uh, unique, we have a primary key that's set up on two columns. So defining the constraints at either a column level or the table level works like this. You can have composite constraints as I as I just indicated and the way to do that would be we would say employee number comma in. So yes you can have a composite key and uh, and then use uh, those of course then that the the set becomes a unique set like between employee number and employee name so. can't have same employee number and same name but you can have same name but different IDs and that'll be fine so. constraints can be defined both at column and table level uh, so we start with the not null constraint so null values are permitted only uh, are, are permitted by default if in Oracle you want to or if in any database you want to have uh, the value should not be null uh, then you add a not null constraint and that's at the that's this is how it's done at the column level this cannot be defined at the table level so table level definition always starts with the word constraint and it's towards the end of the table definition in the create table clause. So when we say not null here, uh, we are going to get a system generated name for this with that's going to start with sys underscore C and then whatever number we are we are at like 115 or whatever. So. We also have the unique key constraint, which can be defined at either column or ta uh, table level. This ensures that each value in the column is unique, although the value can also be null, and we can have multiple values that are null in when you work with the unique key constraint. However, that is not true with the however that is not true with the primary key constraint. Difference between primary key and unique key is unique key will allow nulls, uh, primary key will not. Primary key has unique values, cannot have null values, and it can be defined at either table or column level. Here you see that the department name has to be unique, so a unique key constraint is specified if a same name like in ENG or engineering is used twice, then that will throw a constraint violation or an exception. Same thing with uh, department number, with uh, with primary key, I mean. It can be specified right here, and it starts with the word constraint, and we have the constraint name. We specify primary key, and we specify the column on which the constraint is. That's same thing with the that same thing is true with the, like you have to specify the column name uh, for enforcing the uniqueness. So primary key constraint. Foreign key constraint is usually a relationship that is set up between two tables. So it can be defined at both column or table level. 
and the column that has the foreign key constraint becomes the uh, child table and the one which is referencing the primary key becomes the becomes the parent table so um, so we you guys are familiar with the employee number and department number so when we create the employee table we create all the columns and then we create the foreign key constraint and basically that starts with constraint and then we have our naming convention it says the constraint is between employee and department and department number call and it's a foreign key constraint that's the name we choose and then we say the word foreign key and the foreign key is department number in the uh, department table uh, I'm sorry in the employee table and that is will be referencing the department table and the column department number so. so this is something that you guys will end up using in this lab assignment so kindly focus on this highlighted area and it says constraint, constraint name, uh, foreign key in the table that you're trying to specify. So you specify a column name and then we say it says references, the other table and the column number, column name. We also have the check constraint. Check constraint is basically trying to specify a condition of some sort, like if the value should be between 10 and 99. Generally, the consideration is, you know, if, we, if I come across a word in employee name that's, a, you know, if I want to add a profanity filter, I can do a check constraint um, of a set of strings um, to avoid inserting values that are inappropriate. So check constraint is, is a useful one. It should be used carefully because it can impact the performance of the database. Because you can imagine that when a check constraint is added, like the one you see here, every time I'm going to do an insert in the employee table, if I am trying to make sure that the department number value is between 10 and 99, um, then that code for ensuring the value is intact between 10 and 99 is uh, uh, called multiple times. So we want to be we want to be careful with uh, the number of constraints that can number of check constraints that can get added because that can impact the overall performance. Adding a constraint after a table is created can be done with the alter table command. We can say alter table table name, add, and then the constraint keyword, and then the uh, then the constraint uh, type, uh, and then we put the call. So let's see this in action. So we can say uh, alter table, add constraint, and we specify the name of the constraint, the constraint type, and the column it's going to be on, and what it's going to reference. So each constraints, uh, each constraints syntax, you know, adding or adding a constraint at you know, after the table is created or uh, at the time of table creation. The syntax for the constraint type to be added is going to be different slightly. So, to drop a constraint, we simply do this. Alter table, uh, 
and say drop constraint constraint. Now, if you remove the primary key constraint, uh, you can drop all the associated foreign key constraints by using this. Alter table, and then when you say drop primary key cascade, that's going to drop all the uh, foreign key constraints as well when the primary key is dropped. So again, that's that's a very uh, kind of significant command in that it could impact many, many tables in the database schema, depending on which columns have the foreign keys set up with the primary key. So Cascade will delete all the foreign keys in all the linked tables. So it basically is like a way to delete the links quickly. So we can then go in and say we're going to disable the constraints if, if we want to do some data load or something. So um, um, the idea of disabling the constraint is to uh, deactivate the constraint usage. Now, what is constraint usage? Uh, if I'm working with a primary key and I'm doing an insert, it'll, it will make sure that every time uh, I add a new value in the column that has the primary key, it's going to check against all the existing values. If I'm working with foreign key constraint, uh, it means that if I'm adding a value in the foreign key column, it's going to go to the parent table column and say, the value that I'm inserting, does it exist? If yes, go ahead it. If not, do not add. So, so when you disable a constraint, um, you can, uh, you know, have an issue with the you can we can have integrity violation which means that uh, you know I can insert values uh, that are duplicate for primary key or I can insert values in the foreign key columns that do not necessarily exist in the parent table so um, so you can apply the cascade option to essentially disable all the uh, related constraints in the entire schema. So. And enabling is just the opposite. When we activate an integrity constraint, that's done with the enable clause. So we go alter table, table name, enable constraint and constraint. Now, if you uh, enable a constraint, if there are issues in the data set, then um, we can we can turn it on with a check option, which will go in and say, uh, let me figure out if the data corruption will occur or data corruption has occurred with some of the updates. Um, or you can say, I just want to enable those without the check constraint. Cascading constraint. This is a really cool um, command that helps us maintain referential integrity at a global level, and it makes our database management a lot easier. So, cascade constraint can be used with drop columns, and it will basically drop the referential integrity uh, that refers to the primary and unique keys uh, defined in the dropped columns. I just got a quick notice saying that I may have degraded audio quality uh, in the meeting because of some network bandwidth issues. Uh, I just want to make sure if you end up like with any pauses or bad quality in the bad audio quality, kindly do let me know. Okay. Cascade constraints clause can drop, also drop all the multi-column constraints that are defined in the dropped column. So if, a, if, if we drop a column and it's linked to other tables, then we can, um, then we can use the cascade constraints to drop the constraints on the other columns. So we don't end up leaving uh, unnecessary uh, stealth issues in the in the database. How do we view the constraints? 
we have the user constraints table. So if we go in and find the name or the type or the search condition, then we can essentially just use uh, the from clause with the user constraints dictionary. So one way to look at the details of what everything, I mean, what exists in the, uh, one way to look at what exists in the user constraints is to simply describe it and try to figure out um, what's in it. Like what are all the columns in it, and then you can select more information uh, about each of the about each of the constraints. If you want to see what columns are associated with the uh, with the constraints, then we can say uh, we can go to user con columns. So there we can look at the we can look at the column, we can look at the constraint name and the columns that are associated with it. Of course, there's more information about this in the in the view itself. So, so that part should help you understand how the create table works. One of the things that will come up is uh, working with uh, synonyms. So we are, we, we also need to cover that. So the next topic that we take on is uh, the storage management that is necessary for lab seven. But before we go there, I want to um, focus, a, focus a little bit on uh, working with the other, other database objects. So I'm jumping a little bit into the other slide deck for necessity. And um, there is this one object called a uh, sequence that you, you will need to create. So sequence is another object that is generally associated with the primary key. It can be shared, but I don't recommend you all sharing this, um, sharing the object between multiple tables. And it, what it does is it generates a unique value and it can replace the application code. So let's say you're trying to generate uh, employee IDs, you know, and you want to auto generate those. So generally, if you're, if you have to do an insert in the employee table, you'll need to go look at the last highest value that was generated, add one to it, and then do an insert. So what, sequence does is it prevents that select and insert and uh, because it because you know if you're only doing like a unary like uh, you're adding one to the value it's a total waste of time to do a select and then an insert so they created this idea of a sequence which will speed up the efficiency of accessing sequenced values and they even cache that in memory so they'll go ahead and get uh, you know if we use the caching option it will generate some unique values and keep them in memory, ready to be used for uh, insert or update statements. So sequence is generally created for generating sequential numbers automatically. You can see there's a, there's a lot of options here, uh, about six of them, we'll look through each one. Uh, we basically say create sequence, sequence name, that's it. If you leave that, the default increment is one and it will start with zero. And the max value will, will be no max value. It will just keep going. It will never, it won't have any min value and it will not cycle. Cycle means, you know, well, let's look at some examples. So you all can see what it, what that means. So. So here we have created a sequence called department number. I would, I would encourage you to use this naming convention, please, when you're doing your lab eight, lab seven and lab eight actually. So, and I want usage of sequences in lab seven for each column that is created in your, in your database schema. So we create a sequence called department underscore department number. That'll be used as a prime, that'll be used with the primary key of the department table. We're not using the cycle option here. Why? 
because we're going to start with 91. We're going to allow a total of 10 departments because the max value, uh, the max value is set to uh, 100. Okay, so it starts with 91, goes to 100, incremented by, it's incremented by 1, no cash, uh, in fact, no cycle, and no cycle. No cycle means uh, we are, once we are at a value of 100, we're not going to generate any more value. But if we end up cycling, uh, then the value from 100 will get reset back to 91. No cash. Caching means generating values a little bit ahead of time, which means uh, like uh, if I say uh, uh, cash, you know, I might cache like five values. So it will generate 91, 92, 93, 94, and 95 ahead of time. And doing that, doing those increments and keeping those in memory just improves the performance so the the statement doesn't, insert statement doesn't slow down, so. Sequences are used for like minor uh, enhancements, uh, minor performance enhancements when, when saving the data. Uh, information about sequences is in the data dictionary called user sequences. So you can describe the user sequences dictionary and you'll find uh, some of these columns that they show here. The last number column displays the next available sequence value. There's also a set of con uh, predefined properties that we can use like next value at the time of doing a, doing an insert. Can constraint apply on more than one column at the same time? In other words, can we have a composite constraint? No. Um, you have to use one column at a time or you have to use that with one column at a time. So, and how is that used with inserts? Uh, we'll uh, we'll show you. So, and these are the two properties: next val or cur cur val. Next val will return the next available value, so I don't have to go and you know now do a select. You know, if the next value, last value was 50, next value will be 51. The property cur val will return whatever the last used value was. If you just created the sequence and you started the sequence with 91, then curval will show 91. Uh, if you've used the, if you've called the next trial a couple of times, then the curval will become 93. So, just so you get an idea of how this works. And this is how uh, inserting uh, with the uh, constraints works. So you can see like I have the department number as the primary key and so in this case we are just saying department underscore department number dot next valve. There is the there is the insert and we can go and look at curve valve. We can say depart like you know we can look at the constraint name dot curval and it will tell us what value we are at. So usage of a constraint. Constraint can be modified. So we can say alter sequence, um, sequence name and modify all the attributes we discussed like increment value, max value, no cache and no cycle. You can write a sequence so if you were to increment it every like you know wanted to increment by three, then we'll go from zero to three to six to nine and so on. So, How to use a sequence? Uh, these are some guidelines. So uh, caching sequence values in memory will allow for faster access to those values. Although uh, if you do that, 
if uh, insert fails for some reason, we'll end up with gaps. So if a system, if there's a system crash while doing an insert or you end up doing a rollback, you know, it does, it's not going to roll back the uh, sequence value that was auto-generated. So just bear that in mind. Uh, if you want to uh, just view the next available sequence uh, with the no cache option, you can look at the user sequences column. Uh, and with the alter, uh, alter command, we can change the properties as, as indicated. So the modification of the sequence can only occur if the you have the alter privilege command enabled in your schema. Changing a sequence does not affect existing data. It only affects the future data. If you want to restart the sequence with a different number, you drop it and recreate it. So, so that'll perform some, some, some validation. Dropping a sequence is just using the drop command. Drop sequence, sequence name, and you're, you're, you're essentially done. So. Another object that we create is a synonym, an alias, which is going to simplify access to an object. Um, we can, in this case, refer to an object in the other table. And if we decide to choose some lengthy names, we can, with aliases, choose some uh, smaller names. So you're, you're familiar with the idea of, seek, of uh, aliases when you go through uh, the select statement. Like you can specify an alias for a column. You can specify an alias for a table. Uh, but those are temporary for the query set. This uh, approach of creating a, a, a synonym is, is, is a little bit permanent because it's in the data dictionary and uh, always usable. So you can shorten the length. So, so let's say we have a, a view called department sum view. We can just uh, create a synonym called d underscore sum for department sum view. And this is how we drop it as well. There is no way to alter a synonym. All we do is create and uh, create and drop. So, so in the talk today, uh, I've covered a lot of stuff, by the way, of course. And uh, we've talked about creating a table. Um, sorry for the uppercase there. Uh, we've talked about creating a table, a view, um, synonyms, sequences, and using constraints. The consequences of using constraints is potentially performance. But it's just a simple trade-off. I mean, if we want to have excellent data integrity, then usage of the constraint is a good idea. So, uh, but it can impact the overall performance. The next thing I want to go back to is uh, storage management. So, uh, for that, we are going to look at the advanced create table statement, and then followed by the, some of the storage uh, management attributes that we can use for uh, managing the how, the how the database objects look. We'll take a short break, about five minutes, uh, and then we'll continue. So we covered the create table clause and working with constraints, uh, which are rules that are added for ensuring the data integrity. Um, and then we have views, synonyms, and sequences. So we, we talked about tab create table, we talked about constraints, we talked about synonyms and sequences and views you already know about. So those are the objects or artifacts you're going to have to use in Lab 7 for basing it off of your, you know, you have to write the syntax 
and, and create a schema. In the second part, I'm asking for uh, creating partition tables. So uh, that's the concept we will cover right now. So uh, when we have a, when we have a table, um, what we have to do is uh, put that table in some container. And table space happens to be that logical container. So imagine you have a Imagine you have your operating system and you are running the database on it. And inside the database is essentially a bucket that's created that's called a table space. This particular bucket can span across multiple hard drives. So it gives us almost infinite storage. When a table space is created, we can add database objects in it that allows us to uh, basically almost have infinite storage. So then there's also partitioned objects, which is a term that is used for splitting a table into several smaller chunks. So a lot of information in this uh, lecture. You're going to have to go back and review the recording, I think, uh, one or two times to try and uh, get a you know, full grasp of full grasp of all the concepts that I've covered. When I'm creating a table space, I can simply use this syntax that you see in front of you. So I can say create table space. Um, I specify the name of the table and then I can specify a range of data files. So we have data files and there is a template that um, there's a template that is used for specifying the the syntax for the for the table space. And then I have all these things like extents, block size, uh, whether I want logging, some default values. Should the table space be online or offline, permanent or temporary? And then I also can write. Uh, part of the syntax for managing the extents and segments, two concepts that we haven't covered yet. So, so before we go and deep dive in this, I want to help you with the visuals of how the structure of the table, what the structure of the table looks like. So for that, we will get into this part. I'm going to go to the to the beginning of the slide deck and show you this picture uh, that will provide a little bit of the inner workings of the uh, database. So you can imagine the dotted line on this picture is the table space. And uh, table space, that dotted line, can span across multiple data files. So each big cube is the data file. Inside the data file, I can have multiple segments. Within each segment, I can have extents, like each one of these guys will be an extent. And then inside extent, I'll have blocks. So kind of the, a, a visual hierarchy, if you will. So when we create a table space, uh, on one data file, I can have a bunch of segments, which has extents, and then extents have blocks. And then when the data is, in fact, saved uh, in rows and columns, uh, if there's no, like, rows and columns is like a logical structure. But a physical structure is where is the blocks that's at the at the smallest like at the most atomic level um, we are going to create the the data block which then will um, contain the the rules so does this make sense at a high level everyone um, if there are any questions I would welcome those 
Um, so then the next thing is how are the logical and physical structures organized? So on the physical structure side, which means in the operating system, we have the database block. I mean, we have the operating system block on the hard drive. And then the, the data file can basically go in the on the hard drive using these OS blocks. So one data file can be stored in multiple OS blocks. The smallest unit of storage in the Oracle database is the Oracle block. And generally, one Oracle block can contain many OS blocks. So this is using the Crow notation, which you are probably familiar with by now, considering your work in Lab 6. So one database can have many table spaces. One table space can have many segments. Each segment can have many extents. And, ex and then one extent can have many uh, Oracle blocks. Why do we have extents and segments? We create extents because we don't want to allocate memory one block at a time. So we, we want to say that we need three megs of memory or three megs of storage. And rather than say, uh, give me five kilobytes at a time for each block, we just allocate an extent. When we talk about the segment, uh, we want to specialize the different types of storage. So if you want uh, data storage for a table, we'll put that in a different kind of segment than, let's say, we are working on a database transaction for committing data and we need some temporary space to manipulate whatever changes we are doing, then those would go into like temporary segments. So one thing, one good thing that you want to look at is looking at the Oracle row and the Oracle block. That has a many-to-many -many relationship. That means one block can contain many rows because if the block is large enough and the row is row in a table is essentially determined by the number of columns and the size of each column, right? So you can have a many-to-many -many relationship between Oracle block and the rows. One row can span multiple blocks if it's really large uh, or one block can have many rows if the row is very small. This is a snapshot of the uh, the data storage management and the goal is to help you highlight the idea of segments, extents and blocks in this picture uh, along with other information that is being that is being presented to you. Segment organization, we have application segments and system segments. Again, you know, this is a, a big list of uh, uh, the, the segment types that can be created. Um, and, and those are nice to know. Uh, but the point is that the segments are created for depending on the different type of usage that will go through. So if you do end up creating a table space, uh, you'll end up defining the segments as well for organizing your database uh, layout. There are several storage parameters that we get used to. Initial, next, PCT increase, min and max. You're gonna see in the create table space code, we'll actually use these. So just one, one thing that you're not gonna be able to, while you'll write the code for table space or, or partition tables, you're not given access or authority to modify the or create table spaces in the shared environment because it is a shared environment at the end of the day. So those privileges are not provided, but if you end up with a personal database on a home system, you'd be able to do anything you uh, anything you want. So so initial is the the size of the first extent. Next is the size of the subsequent extents. PCT increase refers to the percentage increase for third and subsequent extents. And we can say minimum and max extends to basically say 
how many extents are allowed within one segment. It's really to cap the, uh, it's really to just cap the size of the, of the segment. So here is the employee table and it has a storage clause. So the storage clause says that initial size will be two megs, next will be 500K, PCT increase is zero, and we're gonna create up to 50 uh, extents. And we specify the table space in which this will be done. So all these storage parameters can be tuned for each database depending on the growth rate of the of the table. You see, if you're if you have a table where you're doing a, a lot of inserts and its growth is going to be very high, then PCT increase can be set to one or two. So you know, based on essentially the growth rate of the table. So in your exercise in lab seven, you have to conjecture the growth rate and choose a specific partition type as well, which, um, uh, you know, which is uh, part of the, part of the exercise. So there is the storage clause. So storage clause is basically a template for these five parameters. So I can specify that, specify the five values as with some default values at the table space level or table, table level using the default storage clause. And when that happens, then if I'm inserting a value in the table space or at the table level, then those values can be set for uh, all the can be set automatically by default. So we don't have to keep repeating ourselves on the default values for the storage. So blocks and extents are allocated when the segment is created. So at least at the, at the starting point. So we'll see a little more of the syntax when we go through create table space. Um, we have a database block organization. So uh, this is again something to uh, consider. This is a view of one block. So each block has a header, it has data, and then there's some free space. So each data block is organized like the way you see it. So the header contains what information on what rows are inserted in that what rows are inserted in that data block. So um, if I have five rows, then I'll have five row IDs in the header. If I have 100 rows, then I'll have 100 row IDs in the, in the data block. So in storage management, one thing I like to draw your attention to is how this storage space is used. So there are two units of measurement. By the way, in current version of Oracle, this is managed automatically. So we've got PCT free equals 20 and PCT used equals 40. That Those are the values that are set. The purpose of this slide is to help you understand the meaning of these two values. So if I say PCT free is equal to 20, that means that this particular data block will continue to receive values or will continue to, it's available for inserts until 80% of the space is used. Now, once the 80%, once we hit 80%, then that particular data block is not available for uh, usage anymore. It's, it's off the free list, essentially. It's, it's not gonna take any more inserts. But it's possible that the rows inside, you know, you add a column or something, then that free space that we set is for, it's like a little contingency that is there for the existing rows to grow in size. So then that way uh, we don't have to move the row from one block to another. We can just keep it there so it can, it can grow in size. Then we go to item three, where we look at the PCT used 
is set to 40, which means that even though the values, let's say we go end up deleting some rows and we fall from above 80 to below 80. So for this row to accept new inserts, we have set PCT used to 40, which means that the level of the block usage should belong should drop to 40% for me to insert new rows in this particular block. So this is a system level concept uh, which basically helps us manage the uh, which helps us manage the number of rows uh, which helps us manage the number of rows um, that can be contained in, in a block. Um, and as I indicated, in the current version of Oracle, this part is automatically managed. There are several storage dictionaries, the list that you can see here. You can go and query these uh, for, for information also. The point of covering storage management was, well, to give you an idea of um, the different type of storage parameters. So when we come back here now, right, and we go through, sorry, one moment, please. Yeah. Can everyone see this slide? Uh, the create table space slide with the detailed code view. Folks, are you there? just want to make sure you guys can see this, right? Perfect. So the point of what I just covered was so you could understand what extent is, what segment is, and what the default storage clause would look like. So then that enables the understanding of the table space a little bit. So, so now we can go and look at some examples. So here we are creating a table space um, with a data file. Size is set to 10 megabytes initial and auto extend is on, which means that the uh, table space can grow in size uh, automatically without us having to adjust the maximum storage length. The second one is uh, where we provide a default storage clause. So you can say, I want initial extent size to be this, next to be this, min and max. And the table space is online. So, so the third uses a clause called extent management local uniform size 128k. What that means is that the statement creates a locally managed table space in which every extent is 128k and every bit in the bitmap is 64. It describes 64 blocks. So it, it is a way of a locally managed table space would mean that the data you data utilized is optimized all within the table space. So, and there are a few more examples that follow that you all can look at to to uh, learn the syntax for test purposes. So, then we have the concept of partitioning. This is a way of taking a large table or an index and uh, breaking that into more smaller man manageable chunks. So when a table is partitioned, uh, we take one column and we use that for, we use that as a partitioning key and save the data across, uh, across several partitions in the same table. So each partition can either have the same physical property or it can have different depending on the depending on the location. So, so partitioning allows for better I/O, uh, enhanced backup recovery, and minimizes data corruption. So, this particular example shows you the. It just shows you how partitions are created. So we have can we can have like our general create table statement. Then we can say we want to partition by range and provide some columns and then provide uh, partition partitioning information. Let's look at different 
types of partitionings and we'll look at examples of each. So you all can go back and um, potentially choose one or two partition types and at least demonstrate on paper. Uh, keep in mind you won't be able to execute these statements in the in the database schema. You can at least uh, uh, demonstrate how the which partitioning type will be used as a result of this exercise. There are four types of partitioning types range, hash, list, and composite. So, so range partitioning syntax looks like this. Generally, you'll put the partitioning syntax in the very bottom of the create table. So in this case, we will say partition by range, and then we have the, the column name, and then partition, name of the partition, and then we'll use the range values clause, which looks, which looks like this. We'll say values less than and provide a value with a comma and use that iteratively. We can also have a table partition description, which is to specify the, the physical uh, look and feel of the, of the specific partition. So something like this. So here we have a table called range sales. Um, the range partitioning is generally used with the number type or the date data type. So if you're creating a partition for date, then we can use this, you know, we've got like partitions for different quarters. Um, we are partitioning by uh, time ID, which is one of the date columns. And you'll also notice that for each one of these, we, we have this value less than clause. So any value in time ID that is for 1st April 1998 or earlier will go in the first partition. Anything on July 1st to April 1st will go in the second partition and so on. If we don't have a partition specified for like later dates, that'll go into the last partition or the max value clause. So, so you can see that, you know, a uh, uh, website like Amazon.com with, you know, they're shipping a ton of products each day. Um, each partition will get used uh, with the timeline as the timeline progresses. Um, depending on the number of orders sold, um, there will be a skew in each partition. So, uh, and so that, that needs to be managed uh, or at least what happens in this, in this case is that if I'm doing a query for, you know, a date range which is within one quarter, I'm looking at a smaller data set and therefore the query will process a lot faster. Unlike when I'm looking at the entire table that is not partitioned. So data partitioning is generally a function of um, data partitioning is generally a function of um, trying to break the data down into smaller chunks for for manageability. So this is the range partitioning type. Hash partitioning is used when you are trying to do lookups of small bits of data randomly. So when we partition by hash, if, you know, I want to find uh, uh, a value quickly and there's only one or two values, then partitioning by hash makes sense. So the clause is shown here, but I'll just show you the syntax. So there is the hash products and it's, it's hashed by product ID. So if I'm searching for a product ID, one ID at a time, hash partitioning will serve our purpose. We have five partitions here, and we're saying when we use the store-in clause like this, and we say table space one, two, three, and four, we're basically using a round robin for um, saving the partitions. When you say five partitions, partition one will go in table space one, partition two will go in table space two, and so on. So the point is that if I wanted to do a search for a range of product IDs, like say 
product ID 50 to 60. Then I'm in, in a little bit of trouble because I'll be doing a lookup for each value and jumping between data partitions to process that query. So if I end up searching for a range of values um, and I'm, I'm trying to choose this, then partitioning by hash is a, is a potential risk. So, because I'll be going all over the place uh, looking for things. Partition by list. This is same as range, except this is for the the virtual data type. So, so this is what you can see. Like when I say partition by list, we are using the NLS territory, and then we specify different NLS territory is a virtual two. So you can see that each partition is set up with a detailed list of uh, the type of data that can go in each partition. So. There is a default which can contain all the other areas that are that are not uh, that are not specified. So. I am left with uh, composite partitioning, which I'll cover next time. And when you are trying to choose the partition type uh, for your lab assignment, just go between uh, range, hash, and list for now uh, to do your lab assignment. And I'll cover composite partitioning type in a little more depth uh, next week. So, so what's happening in lab seven? Let's spend about uh, a minute or so on it so you know it's kind of clear what what will happen so what you have to do is create tables um, based on schema 6 you have to create the tables and add all these you have to add constraints you also want to make sure you use sequences for you know inserting the values let's create those now for this particular lab assignment if I look at assignment 1 so let me take you there Or in fact, assignment two is, I misspoke. You you have this little script, right? That, that initialization script. For lab seven, you're gonna have to create a script like this. So we'll start with like dropping all the tables. Then we'll say create table. And for now, you're not gonna have these insert values. These values, insert values are gonna appear in later in the game. Um, like in lab 8. So don't do any inserts, but go ahead and go through all the create table statements, making sure that you're adding the constraints, the, the column size, the name of the table, and all that good stuff. Um, also, uh, so once you're done with all this, then the then it's a matter of running the script and making sure it doesn't give you any uh, it doesn't give you any syntax errors. So uh, the second part of the assignment is projecting which tables will increase quickly in size and implement partitioning type in at least two of the tables. So, um, and for this part of the assignment, I'm asking you all to choose uh, For this part of the assignment, I'll recommend choosing list, range, or hash, and that's it. And then you can go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and set up your constraints. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you can set up the partitioning type. You can write the code, but for the part two part, you're not going to be able to run the code because the partition type creation is not allowed in the in the in the current data so okay guys so that should give you guys a start on assignment seven and what i'll do next time is finish talking about the composite partitioning type uh, and i'll also give you guys an overview of transactions before we move on to the to the next topic so if i look at the content we've got 
quite a few things still left. We have to go through parti we have to go through index creation. We have to talk about um, data formatting as a review for doing lab eight, database utilities and database security. So we'll we'll need to cover those topics before the final. That is all for today, guys. Uh, looks like I may have a question here. Can we use any type of partitioning for question two? Yes, you can use list, hash, or composite. I excuse me, range, list, or hash uh, from those three. I would stay away from composite type uh, until I cover it. Okay, that's all for today, guys. I'll post the video uh, as soon as it's. Uh, uh, done compiling later, you know, later in the day today. Uh, have a wonderful Tuesday. I'll see you all next time, same place, same time. Bye, everyone.